chocolate and chemistry and dinosaurs too and wonderful wonder filled demos for you and friendly competitions who's gonna win let the games begin we're celebrating science yes science did we mention science we're celebrating science from the oregon museum of science and industry hello we're standing in the Turbine Hall at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, right in front of the earthquake exhibit, excited to celebrate science. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dale Johannes here with my co-host and OMSI educator, Rebecca Riley. Oof. Hey, Dale, before we do anything else, I want to show you something really cool. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Oof. I want to welcome everyone to the show. That's very cool. How'd you do that? I did that with a chemical reaction, and it is also one of the demonstrations we do in the chemistry lab here at OMSI. It is also a not very subtle way to say that this show is going to be full of science and surprise. We do have a packed hour for you. We'll have activities you can do at home, some special guests, a sneak peek at our new exhibit, and we'll have a membership drive with special perks if you join during this broadcast. So let's celebrate science. Hey, Dale. How many times do you think we're going to say the word science during this next hour? A lot, but I'm going to go with 83. 83, huh? 83. Okay. Um, for everybody watching at home, I want you to make a guess right now. How many times do you think we are going to say the word science in this next hour? I already said it twice. Dale said it a few times. At the end of the show, we'll tally it all up and find out how many times we've said the word Science. science. Ooh. Counts, that counts for two. Yeah. Rebecca, you hosted a science competition this morning between two very sciencey families. Ooh. Yeah, I sure did. It was hilarious. It was fun. It was full of science. It was also full of engineering. And we are going to show you these three different challenges the families faced. And by the end of the broadcast, I hope you have at least one of the challenges that you want to try with your friends or family. So let's see the first part of our friendly competition called the Super Duper Games of Science. Hello and welcome to the Super Duper Games of Science, where two families will compete in science-inspired challenges. Doesn't matter who wins, not even a little. So, let's meet our contestants. Team number one, come on down. Hey folks, how you doing? Good. Are you ready for some science challenges? Yes! Awesome. Uh, do you want to tell us your names? Sure. Uh, my name is Tenzin. My name is Mima. My name is Kilsong. Hey, this is Kinshaw. My name is Yuxa. My name is Tosh. My name is Tosh. My name is Nams. Have you come up with a team name? Yes. You want to tell me what it is? Team, team Extreme. Extreme. Team Extreme. You want to try yelling that for me? Team Extreme. Okay, now let's meet family number two. Come on over. Hey, folks, how you doing? Good. Can you tell me your names? My name is Sona Wolchuk. My name is Tenzin Kelsey. My name is Siren Tashi. My name is Tenzin Dargyal. My name is Gelek Gyatol. What is your team name? Team Shapali. Tell me, what is Shapali? So, Shapali means uh, it's a Tibetan dish. Uh, it's stuffed with uh, meat and it's fried. That and sounds it's delicious. One of my favorite dish. Favorite foods? Yeah. Awesome. Um, I hope that I can eat some after the challenge today. That might yes. be fun. Okay, we are ready to start the games between Team Extreme and Team Shapole. The first challenge in the Super Duper Games of Science will be the Balloon Power Knockout Challenge. In this challenge, each family will have 30 seconds to try and knock as many cups off the table as possible without touching them. How can they knock over these cups? By blowing up balloons and using the air from those balloons to knock the cups off. Each family will have hand pumps to quickly refill balloons with air when they need to. Okay, Team Extreme, are you ready? Yeah! Before we start, do you notice anything about these cups? Yeah, it says OMSI. It says OMSI. As soon it's going to say nothing when we knock them all off the table. Um, you're going to have 30 seconds. It looks like you've got some balloons prepped. Are you ready? Yeah. OK, start in three, two, one, go. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, you want to do a cheer? You just got them all up. Yeah. <laughs> balloons for days. Balloons for days. The oh. balloons are so big. You did a wonderful job of working together as a great family team. Okay, it only took 20 seconds for family number one, Team Extreme, to get all those cups off the table. Let's see how long it takes family number two. Okay, it's time for family number two, Team Chapelle, to start our challenge. Do you feel ready? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Do you feel like you, do you have a plan? Yeah. A strategy? Okay, start on three, two, one, go. Team Chapelle, you got all the cups off the table in 19 and a half seconds. So you beat family number one by half of a second. Woo! Uh, look at these balloons, they're so stretched out. <laughs> that was so much fun. We are gonna be back with more Super Duper Games of Science soon. Oh, that was fantastic. It looks like you all had a lot of fun. We had so much fun. You know, OMSI has been inspiring curiosity and innovation in the Pacific Northwest for 75 years. This last year, we had to close our doors to the public briefly due to COVID-19. And I can say, as an educator who loves working with the public, that I really miss seeing y'all's faces. But in great news, OMSI has recently reopened with new ticketing and safety protocols. So now is a great time to become a member or renew your membership. Tonight, among the games and science surprises, we're offering four fantastic membership packages that are available only during this program. Your support will help OMSI stay an integral part of our community for the next 75 years. You can start with an OMSI family membership with just a $10 a month donation. This level of support provides two adults and two kids an OMSI membership for an entire year. You'll also receive two tickets to either the Planetarium or the Empirical Theater with a screen four stories tall. Now that, that is a big movie. Or you can give a bit more and choose the patron membership for your gift of $20 a month for up to two adults, 10 children, and three guests with even more passes, like two OMSI After Dark passes and unlimited planetarium matinees. Just think, you could see the stars during the day. Amazing. You can also choose the Benefactor membership for $40 a month, which provides admission for two adults, up to 10 children, and three guests, plus an attraction pass per guest per visit, and access to OMSI's VIP events. For those of you who would like to contribute at the $100 a month level, there's the President Circle membership, which includes all of those benefits, plus another guest and attraction pass each visit. These opportunities to support OMSI were created just for tonight's program. And you can find the details online at omsi.edu, or when you call one of our volunteers at 503 797 Four five zero zero. Tell them that you want to become a sustaining member of OMSI. As a super special bonus, or I guess I should say a super sweet bonus, if you sign up for a membership or make a donation during this broadcast, you'll be entered into our Moonstruck Chocolate Sweepstakes for a chance to win a design your own chocolate experience. The winner will help create and design a new line of chocolate bars to be produced exclusively by OMSI. If you win, You'll be part of developing flavor ideas, designing the package, and even naming the chocolate bars with the team at Moonstruck. Then the bars you design will be sold right here at OMSI. Plus, you'll have a full year of chocolate bars delivered right to your home. For more information, you can read the contest rules on our website at omsi.edu. All right, everyone at home, and Dale, do you know what this is? It looks like a big nut. It is not a big nut. This oh. is actually a fruit. It is a really delicious fruit, something that you can make into bars or sauce ah. or truffles. Hmm. Um, this fruit rhymes with schmocklet. Ah, uh, that narrows it down. What do you think it is? I'm guessing it's chocolate. It is chocolate, yes. This is the fruit of the cacao tree and the beans inside of here turn into chocolate. Have you ever really thought about what goes into making a sweet chocolate treat? Some of the kids attending classes here at OMSI were wondering more about chocolate, so let's take a closer look. How is chocolate made and what kind of factory do they use? 
Hi, I'm Megan from Moonstruck Chocolate. Where does chocolate come from? How do we make our chocolate? You might think it begins with the moon. But no, it's a whole creative and scientific process. We are standing in the Research and Development Lab. Welcome to my world. Chocolate is actually this. This is a cacao pot. This grows on trees near the equator. Inside of a cacao pod are these beans. These beans are then fermented, dried, roasted, and sorted before we turn it into chocolate. Once it's done being refined, you now get to the point of conching, and the conching helps aerate the chocolate and keeps it moving for 24 to 48 hours. Tempering chocolate is time, temperature, and movement. Once you apply all three of those to chocolate itself, you're able to highlight the most important crystal within the chocolate to create a solid, shiny, and snappy product. Tasting chocolate should actually activate all five of your senses. So I'm looking to make sure that it's shiny, that it's actually contracted out of the mold, that when you snap it in half, it makes a sound. I'm looking to make sure that it's smooth and not gritty. I'm looking to make sure that the sweetness is right, that the mouth feel is good. You wanna make sure that the cocoa butter actually melts within your mouth and coats your tongue. Once a product has been designed and it leaves this room, we then send it to the production floor. On the production floor, we have many wonderful employees who do multiple tasks. One could be enrobing. So we could take a piece of chocolate ganache and coat it in dark milk or white chocolate. It's then run through a cooling tunnel and it's ready to go. On the production floor, we make multiple different things. We coat caramels, ganache, pot de fuit, jam-filled pieces, chocolate bars, Sasquatch bars. Anything you could imagine happens out there. Once they produce a truffle, we then send it for inspection. At that point, I cut open the pieces, check them, make sure that the weights are right, and all of this ensures that you receive not only the best product, but the most delicious product as well. Once the chocolates are produced, they pass inspection. They are then sent to our packaging department. They distribute the chocolates into different sorts of boxes based on the collection, and then we send it down for shipping, and it goes directly to you. And now you know how chocolate is made. The story of chocolate really is amazing. For all of you watching, the Moonstruck Sweepstakes is just one of the many special offers during this broadcast. We also have an online auction where you can bid on all kinds of incredible packages like renting out the huge empirical theater. Hey, you could watch a movie or maybe play video games on a giant four-story screen. That's pretty fantastic. You could also have your own personal OMSI food science workshop. Just go to omsi.edu to see all of the auction items. No, we do a lot of food science and food chemistry activities here at OMSI, and we're gonna share a couple with you tonight. Our first challenge is really a taste challenge. Are you ready for it, Dale? I'm ready, I'm up for this. Okay, I have here some cookies, but these right. are special cookies. They're made with cricket flour. Did you just say a cricket cookie? I did, <laughs> these are cricket cookies. So, cricket cookies are great for you, or eating anything with cricket flour. It's a wonderful source of protein. It also has a lot of fiber, it's super nutritious. There's lots of vitamins and minerals. It's got everything you need for a healthy life. All right, sounds good to me. Okay, you ready to try a bite? I'm gonna try a bite here. Tastes great. Yeah, you can't even taste the crickets. No, it just tastes like a chocolate chip cookie. Every bite of these has three or four crickets in it. <laughs> wow, <Well, laughs> I got my daily Surprise. allowance of cricket, right? Or your daily allowance of protein if you wanted a sustainable source of protein. Um, you can try it out at home, everybody. Also, if you want to get a little crazy, or if you think these were not crickety enough for okay. you, I've got some straight up crickets here. Do you want to try eating just I, a cricket? You know what? I'm up for this. So, these crickets are called chapulines, and they have salt and lime flavoring on them. All right, try little it cricket. Out. Here we go. You just ate me a cricket. You just ate you a cricket. Actually, it's not bad. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty delicious. Wow. <laughs> Okay, what else do we have here? Um, some other ones, we have June beetles here. Wow, okay, can you guys see this? Right, I'm about to eat a June bug. All right, here we go. 
feel like I could hear you crunching that from over here. Because it, it is very crunchy. <laughs> you know what it tastes like? A June bug. It <laughs> hey, the thing tastes like the thing. That's how it goes. All right. I did it. That's pretty good. <laughs> Okay, we have one more food science demo for you, brought to you by PNC Bank, who supports OMSI's work around early childhood education. This demo is one that you can do at home, and it's a great way to use food to make disappearing ink with berry paper. Did you know you can draw a picture on a piece of paper and make it disappear with only a few ingredients? Here, I have a red piece of paper that is actually a piece of filter paper like you use to make coffee with, but it's been dyed red with berry juice. You can use fresh berries, you can use frozen juice concentrate. Let's try this activity with my friend Oscar. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Oscar. Do you want to do a fun science and art activity with me? Mm -hmm. I like this one a lot because I really like to draw. Do you like to draw? I like to draw. A lot? <laughs> so I have here, and I think you have there too, some special paper. What does this paper look like to you? It's kind of pink, uh-huh. So this paper, it used to be white, but I soaked it in blackberry and blueberry juice. And then those berry juices turn the paper pink. Berries are pretty great because they can magically change colors. And we're gonna explore that today. So we have our paper, and then we're gonna make some magic ink. So I have some baking soda here. And I'm just gonna put some baking soda in some water and then stir it up. So this will be our magic ink. Do you have your baking soda water? Okay, and it looks like you have a paintbrush. I'm using a Q-tip. Both of them work if people wanna do this at home. And dip it in your magic ink. So take your paintbrush and draw a picture on your paper. Maybe something really simple. Oh gosh, I'm nervous. What do you notice happening on your paper as you draw with the magic ink? It's turning like green blue. Yeah, it's turning green blue. I made a star with mine. That's awesome. So what we can also do is make this magic ink disappear again, but we want to give it a little bit of time to dry. Now our ink disappearer is vinegar. Um, you only need a little bit, so I'm just putting a little spoonful of vinegar into some water. We're gonna try to make that disappear. So you'll take your paintbrush and put it in your vinegar and your ink disappearer. And then try painting over the top of the smiley face and see what happens. It disappeared. Did it go away? Mm -hmm. And it went to pink again. Oh, yours worked really well. Yeah, it's pink again. I'm gonna reverse it. And I think you can keep reusing this paper if you let it dry between using the ink and the ink eraser. You can keep using it over and over again. Hey, the smiley face is totally gone now. <laughs> so you like turning it back, back pink again? Mm -hmm. So that I can use it again. over and over and over. Over and over and over again. Bye, Rebecca. Bye, Oscar. So why did that work? Well. Blue and purple fruits and vegetables have a chemical in them that changes color in acids and bases. So here, our base, which was baking soda, turned our paper blue or green, and our acid, which is vinegar, turns the paper purple or red. Since the paper is already reddish purple, we say that the vinegar is our ink eraser. I hope you try this at home because this was very fun. And that really is a fun demo and I hope you do try it at home. Of course, if you've spent enough time at home and you're ready to get out and do some other things, the museum is open again. If you haven't been here in a while or you're wondering what's here, I visited OMSI this month to try and give you the fastest tour of OMSI ever. How quickly do you think I can get around the entire museum? Get ready for the fastest tour of OMSI ever sponsored by our friends at On Point Community Credit Union. Are you ready for the fastest tour of OMSI ever? Let's go. Oh, by the way, the dinosaurs are here for the new exhibit, Dinosaurs Revealed, sponsored by our friends at On Point Community Credit Union. Now, let's go. And this is the lobby with the name of the museum, you know, so you know where you are. You're at OMSI! And this is the epicenter where you can experience ground-shaking earthquakes. This is the climber in the new science playground. 
And this is the Teen Tech Center where they have stuff to make music and movies. Who's ready to rock? Just kidding, we don't have time. Planetarium, submarine, bathrooms, fossils, lunch. Oh, yeah, lunch. And this is my friend Tango the Tango, used for OMSI outreach programs. This is the Empirical Theater with a four-story screen. This is the best seat. And now I'm underneath OMSI. Did you know this is where the water was boiled to produce the steam that powered PGE's giant turbines that generated electricity for the entire city of Portland? Okay, guys, how do I get out of here again? No, seriously. Thanks for joining me on the fastest tour of OMSI ever, where there's always something new to discover. Okay, that was pretty good, but guess what? I recorded the slowest tour of OMSI ever. How slow can I go? Let's find out. This is a Tyrannosaurus rex fossil. It's huge. I wonder how many bones it has. Let's find out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just kidding, we wouldn't do that to you. Or would we? 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80. Oh, did I count this one? I can't, I can't remember. Let's just start over. One, two, three. Actually, I did look up how many bones are in Tyrannosaurus rex, and paleontologists guess there are around 200 bones which is about the same as humans. Well, I guess I'm more like a dinosaur than I thought. <laughs> if you love dinosaurs, we actually have a paleontology lab right here at OMSI. We recently asked some kids in OMSI classes what they were wondering about dinosaurs. Let's find out what they asked. I have a question. Did dinosaurs live in Oregon? Hi, I'm Su Wu. I run the paleontology lab at OMSI. We've got a whole bunch of really amazing fossils. This is part of a skull of a triceratops. Uh, the whole right half is missing. It weathered away. It's turned on its side, so you're looking at the bottom of the frill here. And we also have this. This is pretty much a life-size model of the crest of a Parasolophilus dinosaur. Paleontologists believe that they could make noise when they blew air through it. Did dinosaurs live here in Oregon? We're not sure. There's been two bones of dinosaurs found in Oregon, but it's possible that they live somewhere else. Because Oregon was mostly underwater, there weren't a lot of places that dinosaurs could have lived in Oregon. But there were a lot of incredible creatures that lived around here. 230 million years ago, there were giant lizards swimming around the Oregon coast. This is one of them. This is the Thalathosaur. They were giant lizards. They're called ocean lizards, about 16 feet long. And this is a 3D print of the skull. This is a 30 million year old skull from a whale from Nia Bay, Washington. One of the really cool things about it is as an early whale, the blow spout, the nose is down here versus up in modern whales is up here. Inside this rock is a whale skull. You can see just a little bit of it sticking out. Uh, this one and this one was found in Newport, Oregon. They are both about 17 million years old. We took this one out of the rock, but because it was kind of hard to get the rock out of the nose, we left the rock inside. Uh, one of the very cool thing is that doctors and CT technicians from OHSU CT scanned this for us, and they were able to digitally remove the rock inside, and we were able to print it out. This is a skull and backbones from a saber-tooth salmon, also called a spike-tooth salmon. This is a salmon that lived in Oregon in the freshwaters and in the ocean about 12 million years ago. The reason it gets its name is that over here, it's got these tusks coming out the side of its head. This is a 3D print of just this part. 
and you can see the tusk over here. If you could travel back in time to see one of these incredible creatures, who would you want to see? Come visit us here at the Paleontology Lab at OMSI, and I hope to see you soon! Celebrate Science is presented by Vernier Software and Technology and the John V. Jaqua and Kimberly B. Cooper Fund of the Oregon Community Foundation. Now, we have some really big news to share with you. A generous group of loyal OMSI members have stepped up in a very, very big way tonight. To encourage you to join them in building a strong future for this beloved institution, they will match every single dollar up to $100,000 that is donated during this broadcast. Think of that. When you make a donation tonight, your entire donation will be matched. $60, $120, even $1,200 as a President's Circle member, that is doubled. It's easy to showcase your support. You just call 503-797-4500 to become a member or give online if you prefer at omsi.edu and your gift will automatically be matched dollar for dollar thanks to tonight's generous matching challenge. And while we hope some of you are calling in right now for this matching challenge, I wanna show y'all a science trick with some eggs. I love eggs. Okay, so we have some hard boiled eggs on either end and some raw eggs in the middle and we're gonna try spinning them and we'll make some observations. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. So let's spin our raw egg first. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. What do you notice? It's hard to spin. It's a hard raw to spin. Egg. spin. I feel very, like mine's going in slow motion. Very slow. Okay. All right. Now let's try our hard boiled egg, which has a solid center instead of liquid. What's your hypothesis about how this will spin differently? I'm thinking it's going to spin faster. So you think the solid core will make it spin faster? That's what I'm hoping. Let's find out. All right. One, two, three. Ooh. So not only is it spinning faster, what else is happening, Dale? It stands up. This is a great way to know if you have hard boiled eggs or raw eggs, right? This is great, yeah. Ooh. Good catch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so how this works is honestly some very complicated physics, but this science is also how astronomers can learn more about faraway planets. If those planets that are far away have a bit of a wobble as they spin, they probably have a liquid core similar to the Earth. This is great, and this is an, ooh, got a good catch, huh? This is an easy experiment that you can do at home. Yeah. Okay, now let's go back to our super duper games of science to find out what happened with a challenge brought to you by Boeing, the world's largest aerospace company. Okay, folks, it is time for the Stomp Rocket Challenge. Each family is going to be given the body of a paper rocket, and they will be able to choose how many fins, what shape, and what placement of those fins as they make their rocket. Uh, will they choose big fins, small fins, a million fins, maybe only one fin? Uh, who knows? We'll find out. Once they make their rocket, we are going to all work together with aiming and stomping and try to get their rocket right into the center of that O target back there. So, let's start with Team Extreme. Are you ready to make a rocket? Yes. yes. Okay, start building your rocket. Are you ready for try number one? Go! Woo! Zero. Woo! Now, real quick, between try number two and try number three, they're gonna have 30 seconds to update their rocket. Yeah. Woo, oh, that was so close. Yeah. Okay, now it is time for family number two. Family number one, Team Extreme, got really close to the target, but they didn't quite make it. Now let's see what Team Chapelet can do. Are you ready? Yes. Do you have a plan for your rocket? Yeah. Cool, okay, come on over, start making your rocket. Woo! Okay, then you'll have 30 seconds to update your rocket. Woo! 
Okay, it looks like team number two, Team Chapelet, didn't get quite as far with their rocket as Team Extreme did. So right now our score is one point for Team Extreme, one point for Team Chapelet. Uh, we had such a fun time with this Stomp Rocket Challenge. Thank you so much to Boeing for sponsoring this challenge. And what's next in the Super Duper Games of Science? Stay tuned to find out. <laughs> You've seen a rocket, balloons, and chocolate too. But please keep watching, cause there's more for you. Our friendly competition still isn't done. It's gonna be lots of fun. We're celebrating science. Yes, science. Did we mention science? This year, in the time of COVID, when OMSI was closed to the public, OMSI shifted and offered programming like never before. Our educators created virtual programming for schools and people at home. Plus, within two weeks of the shutdown, we began offering childcare to essential workers. Then last fall, we created programming designed to alleviate some of the impacts of all of Portland Metro Public Schools moving to remote education. And then we shifted again to create an even bigger program called OMSI Homeroom, a place where over 500 students, kindergarten through eighth grade, could attend virtual school safely during the day, along with OMSI science experiences. Thanks to generous OMSI supporters, financial aid was available to all families who needed it. OMSI revamped its exhibit space, including ones right here in the Turbine Hall, to be classrooms. Let's take a closer look. I've been coming to OMSI Homeroom for half a year. Wow. It's crazy. I don't really think about that. My name is Sid. I'm a single mom. I have a son named Axel, who is 10. Uh, he's in fifth grade. Axel is, he is such a great kid. He's very witty and funny. He's very creative. He's very mischievous. <laughs> So I'm an emergency department nurse and a trauma nurse here in Portland. I mean, taking care of my first COVID patients was like, you know, going in the room and knowing that they had COVID was really scary. I could have the entire day with all patients having COVID. I think we were all really scared. When school was canceled, it was incredibly stressful because you know, while everyone else was kind of like getting to stay home, like al almost everyone, you know, I didn't have that option. I know a lot of families, when this all started, kind of broke off into pods with other kids from the same school or in the neighborhood. And I felt really bad for Axel because nobody wanted to risk the exposure from me, you know, through Axel. So he didn't get to see like any of his friends really. I did have to leave Axel at home alone sometimes when I went to work. I felt like a bad parent and I was definitely looking at having to go back to working night shifts, which I haven't had to do in years and years and I thought I would never have to do again. So learning about the OMSI program, I like dropped whatever I was doing to like call in and apply to do that. Financially, it was going to be incredibly challenging um, and there would be a lot of cut corners. And when I called to enroll him and I was asked if I wanted to apply for the financial aid program, I said, you know, sure. I was just really beside myself that I was accepted and that this, I think I cried. I was so happy. OMSI homeroom, I think it's pretty awesome. We have hissing cockroaches as a pet. We have four of them, a fifth. 
We named, it was a baby cockroach. We named it Teen, short for Teeny, because it was tiny. The egg drop challenge is basically you build a design and put, find a place to put an egg and you drop it at a high place and see if your egg survives. This is my egg drop. I, my first model was just a cup with a parachute and string, but that failed, so I'm, I'm now using a toilet paper tube with duct tape at the bottom and I'm filling it with string. My favorite part is being able to come up with your own design and being able to just use trial and error to see what works and what doesn't. As a mom, you, you know, coming here so much throughout Axel's life and now it being a daily part of our lives, I'm so impressed. OMSI has been just fantastic at creatively adapting with what we're all dealing with. And it's such a relief to be able to drop him off and just know that he's being engaged, he's interacting with kids. I mean, I think I'm used to, you know, maybe like doing things to help people out. I've done a lot of volunteer work and I've never been the recipient of it. And I'm just so, I mean, grateful is just the only word I can think of that I'm it's just really kind of like blown away that this was available to me. And it will never, like I will never forget it. It will never be lost on me what a lifesaver it has been. I think my favorite moment might be when I lost both of my shoes and I couldn't find them. And I was like, who stole my shoes? And they were in the, they were just in a different room. OMSI knew there was a need in the community. So we created OMSI Homeroom, even though we didn't fully have the funding to do it when we started. We knew it was essential, so we pivoted and created new programming. When you become a member of OMSI, you support innovative programs like OMSI Homeroom and you support your neighbors in need. When you support OMSI tonight, you not only get your own family excited about science, you have the power to pay it forward, empowering OMSI in their continued efforts to give everyone access to their programs. And tonight, you can make an even greater impact, doubling your gift thanks to our generous matching challenge. As we celebrate science tonight, you can support OMSI with a sustaining membership, either by calling 503-797-4500 or give online at omsi.edu. There are four special levels, each with its own benefits, so you can select the one that works best for you. Now, we asked students attending OMSI Homeroom if they had any questions about coronavirus. Well, here's what they asked. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, how are vaccines made? Did coronavirus come from bats? Um, how long has the coronavirus, this, this form of the coronavirus been out? But we haven't known it yet. Is COVID in my poop? Those are some great questions. Now, we have a special guest here from Oregon Health Science University to help us answer these questions and learn a little bit more about vaccines. I'm very excited to introduce you to my friend, Dr. Don Nolt, who's a pediatric infectious disease specialist from OHSU. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm so delighted to be here. Okay, first question, Dr. Yes. Nolt. You're up at OHSU. I am. What are you all doing to address the pandemic? Well, we have two very exciting projects going on. There is one project in which we are looking at sewer water, which is really weird, and tracking what the virus is doing in our state and where it travels. So that would be very important work. Oh, that's fantastic. It is. And then the other thing we're doing is that OHSU is helping the Oregon State Health Department figure out what viruses are infecting people in Oregon. And so there are, as you may have heard, the usual COVID-19 virus, but there are some that have mutated and we're looking at those variants and see how much of that has really gotten into Oregon and how many are infected people um, here in the state. So we're reading about those variants mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And you said that there's three variants here in Oregon. Yeah. So I wanna know, the current vaccines that are available right, right. now, right. 
are they effective with those variants? Well, um, let me take a step back. The two mRNA vaccines were tested at a time and in a location in which there wasn't a lot of variants. Ah, okay. So they look really good. But when, they, when scientists have tested them against the variants, they seem to do pretty well to protect ourselves. And the third vaccine that we have available, the um, adenovirus vaccine, is pretty protective. So I think that if you get vaccinated, you're going to be protected against not only the original virus, but also the mutated ones. We had one of our, our students ask, yeah. How were vaccines made? Can you tell us how vaccines are made? Wow, do you want to give uh, me five minutes or five hours? <laughs> Just give me the really, the really quick, small. how are vaccines made? Sure. So vaccines are made when someone recognizes that there's a problem that needs to be solved. Okay. And so when they study that germ that they want to make a vaccine, is there something about that germ that the body will recognize and fight? And so they develop that, they develop it and see how it performs in animals. Okay. And then they see how it works in humans. And we wanna make sure they're always safe and that they'll work. And that passes those tests, then they're available to the general public. But Dale, that procedure, per, before COVID, that procedure lasted five, 10, 15 years. Now with COVID, we got three vaccines within 15 months. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I have been told that the greatest public health movement we've had in the past hundred years mm -hmm. is vaccines. Well, you're speaking to an infectious disease so physician, I, so I am biased. I think vaccinations are fantastic. Okay, we had another student ask, and uh -huh. this is a great question yeah. too. My son wanted to know this. Yes. Did coronavirus come from bats? What do we know? Well, we know that coronaviruses tend to be very specific to the animal. So dogs can get coronaviruses, cats can get coronaviruses, bats can get coronaviruses. For this particular novel coronavirus, we think it came from bats, but we're not entirely sure. But we do know that it did jump species. Coronaviruses replicate themselves very quickly. They are prone to make mistakes, and that's how mo those mistakes can make it jump from one animal species to another. So we think it could have come from bats or it could have come from other, other animals. And there are other viruses that actually have made the jump from animals to humans. Yes, well, there, has, there has been. How long has the coronavirus been out before we actually recognized it and identified it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't think too long, Dale, because in China, they have been very, very careful to appreciate whether anyone gets a really serious lung infection. Okay. And when there's clusters of people in December of 2019 that were having these serious lung infections, they realized very quickly that this must be a new virus. And so I don't think that this has been around much before people started getting sick and we start paying attention. Okay, so going forward, mm -hmm. we have a flu vaccine that we get every single year. Yeah. It changes year to year based on the variants, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Will COVID be like that? Will we just get a different COVID vaccine every year? It's hard to say. We're still understanding a bit more about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, there are some viruses that hardly change at all, so one shot and done. As you pointed out with influenza, it changes so much that we need to boost every year. We're still trying to understand the tempo of SARS-CoV-2, but it looks like we're probably going to have some future vaccines. Thank you so much to Dr. Noel. Okay, it's time to go back to the super duper games of science now with a design challenge. Let's take a look. It is time for the edible shake tower challenge brought to you by Walsh Construction. In this challenge, each family will have 30 minutes to build the tallest tower they can out of food. Some of the food we have is graham crackers, sugar cookies, gummy bears, M&Ms, pretzel sticks, marshmallows, lots of fun stuff. Once our families make the tallest tower they can, we're gonna put it onto our shake table here and see which tower can withstand the earthquake the longest. Everybody ready? Yeah. Set, build. Our towers are built, now we're gonna check them out. Team Champale, how do you feel about your tower? Okay. okay. You feel okay about it? Um, what were some of your tactics? Tell me about what your ideas were going on around here. Uh, we tried to make a sturdy base, and then at the top we made, a, we filled everything, all the supplies inside. Make it more heavier. Make it more heavier. Oh, so you dumped all the candy inside to make it heavier? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. We love messy science here at OMSI. This is how you know real learning is happening. I'm excited to see what happens with your tower. Okay, now we're here with Team Extreme. How do you feel about your tower? Good. You feel pretty good about it? Yeah. Uh, I really love your decorations. The gummy bears are like little gargoyles on there. Who was in charge of decorating? It was you? Yeah. So you started with a strong base, and then you just kind of at the end made it taller with a little stack of extra cookies? Yeah. Is there any ingredient you wish you had? Glue. Glue? <laughs> that is a great answer. So, which of these towers is going to stand up the longest to our Shake Tower Challenge? We'll find out. Celebrate Science is presented by Vernier Software and Technology and the John V. Jaqua and Kimberly B. Cooper Fund of the Oregon Community Foundation. We're nearing the end of our broadcast, but there's still time to become a sustaining member of OMSI and have access to all the special giving levels only available during this broadcast. Due to a group of generous donors, every donation will be matched dollar for dollar, which doubles your impact. And remember, you can enter the Moonstruck Chocolate Sweepstakes. Plus, we also have an online auction, that's right, where you can bid on all kinds of incredible packages, like your own star party at OMSI, or a night at the museum, ooh, with the dinosaurs. To donate, you just call 503-797-4500, or you can go to omsi.edu. For inspiration, well, here's a moment of chocolate. When we asked students from OMSI Homeroom what questions they had about coronavirus, one of the students asked if COVID was in our poop. It's a great question. Well, I'm here with Dr. Tyler Radnecki, an associate professor in the College of Engineering at Oregon State University, who has been studying wastewater systems for evidence of the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. Thanks for joining us, and why don't you take that one away? Is COVID in our poop? So COVID is in our poop. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID, is what's called an enteric virus, which means if you are infected with it, you shed it through your intestines and into your poop. Wow, that's a good answer. Okay, so COVID is in our poop, just to answer that question. So I have read a lot about the community prevalence that you are doing, looking at community prevalence of COVID through wastewater. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your methods? Yeah, so the, the methods are, are relatively straightforward here. So the idea is we know that the COVID virus is it's in our poop, it's in our wastewater. And so when we go to a wastewater treatment plant, we can collect a sample, filter it, and then examine it for the virus. And if people in the community are infected, it'll show up at the wastewater treatment plant. Oh, that's fantastic. Can you also trace the variants through the wastewater? Yes, ab absolutely. So uh, when we take the virus out of the poop uh, to detect it, we can also sequence it as well. And from there, we can look for all kinds of variants, including variants of concern, which gain a lot of headlines. So is COVID in our, just in our poop or is it in our urine as well? The science is still debatable on that. For the most part, we believe it's just in our poop and our fecal material. Um, there have been a couple of preliminary studies suggesting potentially in, in the urine, but generally your kidneys do a really good job at filtering your fluids out of there. So viruses in, in your urine is much more rare. That's fantastic. You know, earlier today we had Dr. Don Nolte, who's an infectious disease pediatric specialist at Oregon Health Sciences University, and she was talking about how they're tracking the variants. But it sounds like you're doing the exact effort that they're doing just in a different way. Yeah, so there's, there's a difference um, between more traditional clinical uh, testing where a, an infected individual goes in to see a doctor and, and gets tested compared to the type of uh, community surveillance that, that we're doing. So in our case, we don't need to have a person realize that they're infected before we can test them. All right. So as, as we like to say, right. you flush, you participate, right? <laughs> as far as our study goes. <laughs> and, and so that's one of the big advantages of, of our, of our uh, system is that everybody participates, whether, whether they realize it or not. So it takes no effort from the community, yet we can still get a community-wide perspective of what's happening. Have you all identified any of the new variants that we hear about? 
Uh, yes, so uh, back in January, uh, we were surveilling Bend, and, and what we found there was B117, more commonly known as the UK variant. Oh, yeah. And so we were able to find it, find it there. We've also been tracking um, other variants, colloquially known as the LA variants as well, starting to come in, into Oregon. Uh, and so, yes, the short answer is we have been able to detect new variants. And the other great thing is we've sequenced over 2,500 wastewater samples to date. And as new variants are discovered, we can go back through our catalog and see if they exist in Oregon right now or if they had previously existed. And so we can start to get a sense for how widespread is the problem, how, how, what does it look like on various timescales. So that's great from a public health standpoint that you guys are way ahead of this. Yes, we're building a, a, a massive database you know, that we can continue to mine for information as we learn more and more about the different variants that are of concern that maybe we weren't aware of previously. Okay, here's a question. If somebody's vaccinated, mm -hmm. right, will that variant or will COVID still show up in the fecal matter, in the wastewater? And how can you tell if somebody's been vaccinated or not? So we cannot, it's a great question. We cannot tell if someone's been vaccinated or not. That's not the type of information we can find from, from wastewater. Uh, the question about the vaccine will not cause you to shed virus okay. into the wastewater. So that was a big concern yeah. um, for, for a lot of people. And whether or not you still can be infected with the virus and shed it while vaccinated is still a very open research question that, that we're trying to address. So whether you've had the vaccine or not doesn't matter. The, the, the main concern here is somebody is carrying COVID and it's passing into the wastewater system. Correct. Okay. Correct. Got it. Thank you so much, Dr. Tyler Rednecki, for your work at Oregon State University. That's fantastic. Thank you. Okay, it's time for the big finale of the Shake Tower Challenge, brought to you by Walsh Construction. Each team has designed a tower made from graham crackers and ice cream cones and all sorts of candy, lots of icing and sugar, it looks like. And we are gonna test how strong these towers really are. On this side, we have Taim Shapale. Can you wave? Hi! <laughs> and on this side, we have Team Extreme. Woo! <laughs> uh, before we shake, because it'll be the tower that is still the tallest after the shaking's done. So if part of your tower falls over, it'll be whatever's left. We're gonna measure to see how tall they are before we start. So Team Chapales is <laughs> nine inches, I think. I'm gonna say nine and a half inches. Okay. Team Extreme is starting out at also nine and a half inches. Okay. Woo. So somehow you both managed to make exactly the same height of tower. I love it. We're gonna see which one can stand up to our shake table. We're gonna start it off the slowest and see what happens. How do you feel so far? Yeah. Can we, do you think we can go faster? Yeah. Woo! These are both really stable towers. <laughs> it's still going, oh no. Look at that one. That's your height. Is it gonna last? Is the gummy bear holding it up? That is a, that is a well-placed gummy bear. Okay, so it looks like this one stayed up completely, and this one we had a little bit knock over, so we're gonna see how tall is this one after we shake. Nine inches. So when this top one fell over a little bit, you lost half of an inch, which means Team Extreme has got Shake Tower Challenge. Although. It was so close for every round with both teams. I am so proud of both of you for doing so much science. Uh, do you wanna give, every, give the other team an air high five? Ready, set, go, woo! <laughs> Good job. Thank you so much to Walsh Construction for sponsoring our Shake Tower Challenge. Those games were so much fun. Every challenge was so close. Those teams were really well matched and we had a ton of fun learning and exploring together. I hope you all can try some of these challenges at home. And if you do want to big, build a big house made of food, I recommend some stiff royal icing. <laughs> now, at the very beginning of this broadcast, I asked you to guess how many times you heard the word science during this broadcast. Well, we have your answer. Yeah, but before we give you the answer, there's still time to become a sustaining member of OMSI and get the special levels available only during this broadcast. 
grab your cell phone. Call 503-797-4500 or visit omzi.edu. And remember, your donation is still being matched dollar for dollar. Okay, how many times did the word science appear during this broadcast? The answer is... Wow! That's a lot. That was a super lot. If you were anywhere close to this number, great job. That's a lot of science. Uh-oh. See, I said it again. That threw off the numbers. Thank you so much for joining us to celebrate science. On behalf of Rebecca and me, we hope to see you at OMSI very soon. You saw chocolates and chemistry and dinosaurs too. And wonderful, wonder-filled demos for you. But sorry to say, our show is all done. We hope you had lots of fun. This bro studios. <laughs>